Thanks for coming today. It's an honour to be here, actually, because everything that's been talked about this morning by all the speakers is bang on message, not just for Mitsubishi, but actually for the industry as a whole. Um, yesterday, I don't know if you saw the David Attenborough speech that he gave. It was incredible, really. It was brilliant that he did it. Um, I mean, for me, he's a kind of superhero on millions of levels. Um, but also, I found it quite sad that someone who's been at the forefront of ecology for such a long time. You know, we've had all sorts of fads, haven't we, with ecology, we've had the hippie age, and you know, we've had straw bale houses being built on programs like Grand Designs, and everyone's saying we've got to compromise on our way of living. You know, we've had, all of this stuff has been going through David Amber's whole career, and I thought, <clears throat> it's kind of quite sad that at 93 years old, I think he is, that he's still disillusioned by the lack of pace and change globally. Um, I put this talk together a few weeks ago, actually, but um, it, it's actually quite nice to be doing it the day after that he did his, and on a, under a slightly different forum, uh, because I'm going to talk about a similar level of global thinking, if you like, but related to homes and home design. So taking all of his big picture stuff and bringing it back down to how we do homes in the UK. I'm an architect, I'm a builder, I'm a home obsessive. I put this slide in on purpose because I'm just as bad as everybody else. Because over there, I'm burning some fossil fuels. Yep. <clears throat> We've been brought up in a, in a way, haven't we, to, to depend on certain fuels, <clears throat> certain ways of living. So what's actually needed, and I'm going to jump straight in, is systematic change on a number of levels. Systematic change on a global level, at UK level, government level, and a personal level as well. And another thing I'm going to talk about at the very end is education. Because without education, and I've been educated by the team at Mitsubishi, without education, nothing's going to change, in my humble view. Now, if I went out and did a little straw poll on a street, let's say I just did one of those kind of vox pop things, and I went down a high street and said, can I just ask you three questions about uh, air source heat pumps? The first response you get is, what's one of them? And then you've got to go through the process of explaining it. Now that requires a level of education for people out there to understand what that technology is. Now you're all here today because you generally know what it is. Yeah. But the layperson on the street doesn't. And until they change their mindset or we help them change their mindset, they will continue ordering one of those 1.6 million boilers every year, gas boilers, that's been put in domestic properties. So I'm going to bombard you with a lot of slides. I've probably got double the amount of every other speaker, so I'm going to be quite quick and quite punchy with it, because there's a lot of things that I want to cover. Some of it's quite personal. There's me. Look at that tracksuit. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I've put this in for a number of reasons, to be honest. The first one is I'd like to think that my nana was the innovator for feature wallpaper. <laughs> <coughs> she took it to an extreme because she did it on every bloody wall in the house. Um, and the other reason I put it in, to be honest, is because of my granddad. My granddad was a builder. Uh, without him, uh, not just because of biological reasons, but I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for him. Um, he taught me so much. He, he wanted, when I said I wanted to become an architect, he helped me every step of the way. Uh, when other kids were playing with Lego, I was on building sites with him when I was seven, eight, nine years old, uh, before health and safety kicked in and then you weren't allowed to do it anymore. Um, and he was an amazing man, actually, working class bloke, grafter, hands kind of four times the size of mine because he had a proper job. And, uh, but he taught me to look at the world around me, to be honest. He'd always say, keep your head up. You know, don't be like the other lads on the estate with their head down, look, they're all miserable. Keep your head up, look at the world around you and absorb it and start to understand it. And one of his key phrases, I should have put it on his headstone, is knowledge is wealth. Knowledge is wealth. And he never meant that from a monetary point of view. He meant it from a life experience point of view. You will get more out of life if you increase your knowledge about it. And he also told me to ask questions, which made me the most annoying little shit in the world. Yeah? Because I was always, well, why do they do that? 
why do they do that? Why don't they do it like that? Why do we do it like that? Now, in some ways, that's kind of made me the person I am today. Because quite often, when you're trying to gain knowledge all the time, you say, well, why? And how can we do that better? Why do it like that? How can we do it better? The other thing about this, I take the mic out of my Nana's um, feature wallpaper. But um, I found out years later that the reason why she did it was because of cost. And you probably think, well, that's bonkers. What, what are you talking about, George? The reason why nearly every wall in our house was different wallpaper is because she used to buy the end of roll stock from wallpaper shops. So when you went in a wallpaper shop back in the day, there'd be a little bin or a series of bins in the corner next to the checkout tills, and there'd be random rolls of paper in there because there wasn't enough, ro there wasn't enough wallpaper in stock, whatever Jonathan Ross there, there wasn't enough wallpaper in stock uh, to wallpaper an entire room. Now, I quite like that. So because my nana was skinned, she was really cool in my eyes. She was really funky when it came to interior design. But obviously, through everything that I'm going to talk about today, cost is paramount, isn't it? It just is. It's just a fact of life. Yeah? If we're going to talk about innovation, how are we going to pay for it? If we're going to talk about new technologies, how are we going to pay for it? Yeah? Because it's always the easy arg argument back, isn't it, from industry all the time. Well, that's all well and good, George, but how the hell are we going to pay for it? Yeah. So we've got to bear that in mind through virtually every slide. Now, where I was brought up was amazing. I didn't even realise how brilliant it was. So in the 1960s, there's my mum's house. Funnily enough, my sister lives next door. My mum uh, moved into this house in the late 1970s. Now, where I was brought up was in a new town. I was born in Sunderland, but I was raised in the new town in between. Now, the level of ambition in the mid-1960s in what was predominantly a pit town, or a series of small pit villages linked together, it was, let's build a new town called Washington and they formed the Washington Development Corporation, and in a relatively short space of time, they built an entire town for 80,000 people. But they didn't just build houses. They built a shopping centre, schools, industrial estates, healthcare, the lot. All done. They got some of the best architect in Europe to be involved in the highways and the master planning, everything. Yeah, it wasn't just highway designers, it was architects, designers, urban thinkers, working with planners, highways, transport, landscaping, the whole lot to come up with an agenda for what they regarded as a new way of living. Yeah. Now, obviously in the 60s we had lots of new ways of living that didn't quite work out. But this was bloody brilliant. And I had no idea how good it was until I went to university. Seriously, when I got to university and I took architecture very seriously at an academic level, I was thinking, hang on a minute, why are we building estates like that when I've lived in one like that for the last 30 odd years? Why are we doing that if the transport system that I had when I was a kid works much better than the one we've got now? And to pull together a team of very passionate, clever, very clever innovators to think of doing a town in a different way to the point where it was very humane. It was radical, but it was humane. Most of the houses were two-storey, three-storey houses, front garden, back garden. We weren't building you know, massive, huge concrete tower blocks or cities in the sky or anything like that. Very well pedestrianised. I could walk out of my mum's front door and here there was a square. No cars allowed in that square whatsoever. I could walk through that square, which according to my mates, it was called Georgia Square. Yeah? So you felt like you were part of the community. It was like, oh, let's play in Georgia Square. Oh, let's go and play in Paul Square. Because yeah? it's where your mates lived. You'd hang out in their square. So it was a cluster of housing around the square. Now, these are all two stories. You can see at the top some little single stories. Yeah? We had the OAPs, predominantly in the single stories at the top. Yeah? On the opposite side of my mum's terrace, there was more two stories. And 90 degrees to my mum's house, there was two and three story houses for extended families. Yeah, so the two stories were four bedroom, really well planned, fantastic space standards, really, really, really good space standards, integrated storage, wardrobes in the right place, plug sockets in the right spot. Yeah. Even though it had this ribbon window effect upstairs, um, your bed could then go on three of the walls. It couldn't go on the fourth wall because the bedroom door was there. But you've got fantastic levels of natural light. 
And I could walk to school, which was two miles away, and didn't have to cross a single road. So hardly any kids in our state got knocked over. The landscaping strategy was outstanding. Absolutely amazing. Now, they put your car right outside your front door. Yeah, right outside your front window. Because the developer will tell you that no one wants to walk far with their shopping. Well, if they carried the bags a little bit, they might lose a bit of beef. Yeah? You know, it doesn't affect anyone now, Steve. It's absolutely fine. And honestly, hand on heart, I'm not even romanticising it. I've analysed it to the nth degree, even with all the training that I've had, and I'm going, why aren't we doing it like we did in the 1960s, when we built really good, some good, really good human estates? Now, at the minute, we've got a massive problem. This is where I'm going to sound like Mr. Misery. This is where I've got my David Attenborough hat on, and I'm going to whinge for the next 10, 15 minutes. So bear with me, because this is a really interesting diagram. Just bear with me on it, right? This, 1970, we were building just over 300,000 houses at that point. Yeah? So there's your dates, 1970, all the way through till 2015. Yeah. Now, this dark bit was your private house builders. This grey bit was local authorities. Yeah? And if you look at the number of houses generally built by the private house builders, all right, it's up and down, up and down a bit, but generally it's been roughly around the same level. Yeah? But what's absolutely collapsed at a catastro catastrophic level post-lunch is local authority council house building. Yeah? Housing associations is this little grey bit here. That's your HAs running through there, who do a fantastic job. Absolutely amazing job. So in effect, we have privatised home building in Britain. Simple as that. Yep. The thought of someone building a new town like mine, where 60,000 of the 80,000 houses were council, proper council houses, forget it. Never going to happen. Yep. Because what Thatcher did is she put it all onto the private industry to build what should be proper, affordable homes for society. I'm going to stick my neck on the block. Private house builders don't want to do that. Not interested. Because it's a pain in the backside and they don't make money from it. So profit and commodity has been put before truly, truly affordable homes. And I mean truly affordable ones, because now when we say, oh, we've built some affordable, and I go and have a look at it, I'm like, that is not affordable. That's still like 10 times you know, the, the salary of someone that lives in the local area. You might get a little bit of help to buy and all that to get them up there. And as we know, that's just created a massive property bubble in itself. So we've become dependent on the private industry to build all of this. And the result? It ain't happening. Not happening at all. So housing demand, is, you know all this already, but I'm just going to kind of re-emphasise it. Housing demand is way beyond the current level of supply. Miles off. And that's simple economics, isn't it? If we've got lots of people wanting a small amount of housing, the unit price of each one of those houses goes up through the roof. It's that simple. So we need to build a lot of new homes if we're going to have the population expansion that we've got at the minute. All of this would be solved if we just didn't expand the population. And how on earth, and I keep saying this to government, the government keeps saying, we're going to build 300,000 houses. Because the industry is just not set up to do it. We don't have enough skills. We don't have enough trades. The planning system doesn't move fast enough to allow us to do that. Right? We're not going to do it. But what worries me more is what we're building. It can't just be a numbers game. There's no point in building 300,000 crap houses. I know, I know it sounds like it's an obvious thing to say, and I'm not saying everybody is doing that. There are some good house builders out there doing some good work. There really are. I work with a number of them. But when you look at some of the big mass house builders, they're not building to a good enough standard. Now, at the minute, we're doing nearly 200,000 houses a year. That's like, I can't quite do the maths, 15,000 a month, something like that. I can't quite get my head around us building 15,000 houses a month. That's a lot of houses being built. And they're being built really quick. And standards are being compromised every step of the way. Why? Because it's become a numbers game. And it's become a commodity game. 
And Mark Farmer uh, published a report. The government asked him to do this, yet another bloody report that the government have done in the housing crisis. I mean, I started in architect's practice when I was 16 and they talked about the housing crisis back then in 1990 and we're still banging on about it, yeah? So Mark Farmer does this and it was damning. It was called modernise or die. That means we need to think differently about how we do everything in the industry for it to be transformed. And just quickly, low productivity, structural fragmentation that's been talked about already, low margins, workforce size, lack of R&D, massive lack of R&D and investment, low predictability, leadership fragmentation, dysfunctional delivery model. I mean, it can't get more damning than that. Lack of collaboration, and as we all know, a poor industry image. And if that hasn't sent a rocket up the backside of government, I don't know what can. And this is me, you know, I'm, I'm criticising an industry that I love. All I've wanted to be was an architect that designed homes and housing. I mean, is it really the best way? Let, let's just look at it for like 10 seconds. We build houses like the Romans. We might have a bit more insulation. All right, I mean, the, to be honest, the Romans had indoor toilets as well, so even that's not an innovation. We went backwards after that. Um, they dig a hole in the ground. Yeah, we pour concrete, wet trades. Yeah. Then we lay bricks and blocks. Yeah. I mean, there's been a brick shortage recently and everyone went, oh, we just can't build houses fast enough, rather than going, well, should we build it out with something different to bricks if there's a brick shortage? Yeah. Then you get up to eaves level. Then you get the roof timbers on. Right? Then you get your tiles on the roof. Same tiles that the Romans used, predominantly, to be honest with you. Still timber frame roof trusses. Then you want to get wind and water tight. We're always waiting for the glass. I don't know why. Glazing always takes ages. It's always the glass. Yeah? And then the glazing all gets delivered and gets put in. Thank God we're wind and watertight. What do we do then? We're pouring concrete floors, wet screed, Yeah, We've got all that exposed block work. We start running cables everywhere. And then a plasterer comes in after it's been boarded and works his nuts off to get the wall as smooth as the board that he's just put up beforehand. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. You know, I love a good bricky. Awesome. And we need those skills. When we've got 27 million houses across Britain that still need to be refurbished, updated, extended, transformed as part of the retrofit economy, we need good brickies, we need good plasterers, we need good electricians. We still need all of those traditional trades. But isn't it nuts that we use so many wet trades in a house? And no one could go into a room when a plasterer is working, can they? You can't do anything. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, get out, I'm not finished. Get, I've got to get this room skimmed. And he's there for hours. Mainly men, which we'll talk about in a minute. You know, going like that for hours. And I, how the hell you plaster a ceiling? I still can't get my head around that. It's an amazing skill. But it's stupid. It's completely daft. We have lots of boards out there that do exactly the same job and are far less labour intensive. Then you've got to wait for the plaster to dry out. And then everyone panics. How many sites I go to now? And there's dehumidifiers everywhere. Trying to dry it all out. Dry it out too fast, it cracks. Then we've got a paint and decorate. Wet, 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 wet. Then we've got a tile of bathroom, grouting. You know. Tyler's doing amazing, cutting everything on site, dust going everywhere while someone's trying to paint and decorate a room. I mean, honestly, if anyone of any sound mind analysed the inefficiency of a new build, mass developer, build house, you'd think we're in the dark ages still. All right, we might have boilers or insulation or double glazing. It's a bit better than my mum's house that was built in 1968. But it ain't that much better. It's not rethinking construction at the level that we need to. And this is me being an architectural snob and I will not apologise for it. Right? Because one of the comments that was made by Nick is that one of the criticisms of innovative off-site modular house building is, oh well, you know, if you do prefab, it'll all look the same. <laughs> You're having a laugh. I mean, seriously. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And it's not just the houses, is it? Let, let's be really honest about it. It's not just the houses. It's the places that we're creating. Who's building the shops? Prop, you know, proper shops. You know, who's building the local schools? Because the education system, as we know, is bursting. You know, who's building the new health centres? Who's building all of those community facilities that create a proper sense of place? Now, some developers are doing it really, really well. 
in certain parts of the country. But I'll tell you what, the vast majority aren't. Because the culture that we're creating is an Americanized culture where the car is going to absolutely dominate. Because you pull up to your house and you pull your car up outside. There's no shops anywhere. Can't walk to a shop at all. So to go and buy a pint of milk, you've got to get in your car and you've got to drive and go and get it. How many new local shops have been built on estates? Honestly, walk around any new estate and show me a shop. I'd love to see it, because I haven't seen one for about four years, walking around big mass house building projects like this. So it's not just what we build, it's where we build it, how we build it, and the communities that we create around it. And we know that we need energy. We know we've got a massive densification of populations. Isn't it amazing that in 2014, for the first time in the history of man and womankind, more of us now live in urban towns and cities than we live in the countryside. That's happened in our lifetime. Yeah? So from predominantly being an agricultural planet, with lots and lots of people working in fields and doing agricultural work, which wasn't that long ago we were doing it in the UK before the Industrial Revolution. Now, for the first time, the majority of us live in towns and cities. And that means there's a massive rush to build in towns and cities to the point where it's been rushed so badly. Can you believe that that development is only 10 years old? All right, it's not in the UK. <laughs> it's frightening. It's, it's scary. You know, and this is something that you know, David Attenborough has talked about a lot. And you know, the, look at the change that's happened in the discussion of plastics in the sea just because of David saying what he said last year. It's amazing, isn't it, really? But, we all knew about it. We just didn't do anything about it. So everything that we do has an impact. And I've put this in for a very, this is a very personal thing. I've put this in because I cannot understand why there's such an extreme divide between what we build and how we live and the natural environment. It's like you can build over there and build a lot if you want. And over there, we're going to keep the green belt because that's really lovely. Yeah, you can't affect that. I, I mean, thank God we have got a green belt in some ways, otherwise we would have built on a lot of it. But it's, surely there's a more harmonious way of thinking about how we build and design houses rather than having this staggering boundary between the built environment and beyond. And is that really the best we can do? I mean, come on. You think about how other industries have moved over the last 20, 30 years. The air industry, automotive industry, telecommunications, IT, connectivity, all the stuff that's been talked about this morning. Staggering levels of R&D. Real disruptors coming into the industry to try and change the way that we think and do things. And you get all these, you know, you get your Ubers, and whether you like them or not, or your Airbnbs. You know, these disruptors that come in and think about doing things differently. But still, we build houses like the Romans. So we need to think green. It's not rocket science, is it? But we need to think about being green in a very, very different way. Because at the minute, there's a big debate between environment, comfort, and I've missed another bit off, cost. Yeah? What cost are we really going to put on the environment? You can do it, actually. It has been done. But yeah, there is a cost associated with the amount of damage that we're causing the environment. And I'll come back to what I said at the beginning. We need systematic change with big business, big industry, who, if I'm honest, are the biggest, biggest polluters. That has to change. And then we have to change individually about how we live. And I'm not talking about being a bunch of hippies who live in a straw bale house and don't eat meat and don't have a car. Right? We're not going to do it. We are not going to make that change to our lifestyle. We're not going to do it. But what we have to do is embrace technology and research and development and innovation to live in a very different way or think in a different way. So how do we think green? How do we do things differently? I've used this slide now for about seven years. And I'll probably use it for the next 30 years that I'm on this planet if I'm lucky. Healthy living, healthy planet, healthy home. If you actually put health at the foremost point of everything that we do in home design, and I'm talking about all aspects of health, air quality, material technology, mental health, physical health, 
Someone's buying the drinks. Who was that? Yes. Excellent. How much money's the college got for you to buy all the drinks? <laughs> Budget's gone. Fucking same old story, isn't it? No. Um, think about it. If, you, if I was to say to you, let's say you're not an architect, you're not a designer, you're not a house builder or anything. What is your idea? What is your dream of a healthy home? All aspects of health. Everything. Psychological well-being. Air quality, all the stuff that I've just mentioned. You'd come up with something quite interesting, I think. Wouldn't you? You wouldn't do what the house builders are doing. Now, you don't have to be an architect to be able to think differently. You don't have to be a designer to think differently. I used to do this thing. I was going to talk about this, actually. A few years ago, I used to um, stick, a, stick a sheet of A4 paper in front of anyone. I'd say, draw your dream house. And I did it to my mum. The first thing that comes out of everyone's mouth is, I can't draw. If you can put a mark on a piece of paper, you can draw. Everybody in this room can draw. Yeah? And I say, draw your dream house. My mum, in about two and a half minutes, drew a single story, a little single story kind of quite modern pavilion house with a courtyard in the middle. And honestly, I was shocked. I was expecting the play school house. You know what I mean? The kind of pitched roof, two chimneys, the wiggly path, the four sash windows, the tree off to one side. Yeah. A couple of little funny birds and a sunshine. Yeah. And, I, and it was a little 3D, you know. It was like a little kind of axonometric 3D drawing. And I said, why have you drawn that? And she said, well, as I get older, I want to live in a bungalow. I want to be in a single-storey house. I was like, Mum, that is a really cool modern bungalow, though. That's not like your normal old-school bungalow. And she went, no, no, I want to live in something new, something innovative and something that's really cool. I was honestly shocked. You could have knocked me off my chair. And I said, what about the courtyard in the middle? And she said, well, I just like air movement through the house. And I was like, fucking hell, we're talking about, like, environmental design with my mum. <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, I was shocked. I like air movement, so I want to be able to open every room onto a little courtyard, and if I do it onto the courtyard, it means no one can break in when the windows are open, because it's a protected space. And it means the grandkids can play in a safe courtyard environment like, where I can watch them from every room in the house. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Yeah. So when we're pushed, we can all think differently about how we want to live. We should make everyone do a little A4 sketch before they leave, shouldn't we? Should we set that as a little Mitsubishi challenge by the end of the day? We might have to give them a few drinks first. Come up with something really wacky. But it's interesting, isn't it? If you ask a certain question in a certain way, you're going to get a unique answer. So why can't every single house that we do be about health, happiness, happiness and well-being? Now, if you just had, like, you could do a PhD just on happiness in a home. What would make you happy? Well, I'd like to be debt free. I wouldn't like a utility bill every month. I don't want that financial pressure in my life. All right, then how would you like to live differently? If you want to be mortgage free, how do you think you might be able to do that? Because if you want to live mortgage free, you wouldn't go and buy a house for 400 grand and put down a 15% deposit and get a 85% mortgage that you've got to pay for the next 25 years, would you? You'd go, I want to live differently. If you didn't want utility bills at all, all right, you might have to pay them for a short period of time, but how could you do it? differently now so that there's a change to take off that financial pressure to make you happier in your home. Could you change the light levels in a house? More natural light. Could you have a lovely view of a tree? Do you know what I mean? It's all personal, isn't it? But what would make you happy in your home? And I guarantee you it wouldn't be the stuff that's been built before. I'm going to have to be really quick. Right? Now, I am not an eco-warrior. You're going to think that I am when I'm talking about this, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm a kind of I'm a futurologist or whatever you said before. I quite like that. I might nick that. Um, because I believe that through innovation we can live a greener life. I genuinely believe that. Because we aren't going to go back, if I'm honest, to being medieval and living differently. Now the sun is awesome. It's brilliant. Whoever invented that thing is a genius. It is fantastic because it can provide absolutely everything, not everything, but most of the things that we need in terms of its radiation, its wavelength, everything. Because 
I should have put this in bold, actually. Forget about everything else. More power from the sun hits the earth in a single hour than humanity uses in an entire year. That's a fact. More power from the sun hits the earth in one single hour than we use globally in a year. Now, how stupid are we to not harness that? What? There's that, yeah, which is why I'm talking about systematic change. And you're, right, you're absolutely right. You know, why are we still using oil and gas? Because there's big corporations that control that and want to charge us for it. Those, they're petrified. You know, they might be loving it now, but they're shitting themselves about the Green Revolution and what difference that's going to make. What they should be doing is they should be thinking differently and saying, right, rather than providing oil and gas, why don't we provide something else? Why don't we do it in a big, different, in a mass way, in a huge way? It'll come when they're screwed. Now, at the minute, we're only 20% efficient at turning that, that stuff that leaves the sun and hits the earth. We're only 20% efficient in turning that into power, right? But still, if we're only 20% efficient at harnessing that, I love this, we, we'd only need it to solve Brexit. We'd only need to cover a land area the size of Spain in solar panels to power the earth renewably by 2030. Someone's actually worked this out, you know, something about 678 quadrillion BTUs and power from the sun. I love the fact they've worked it out. So we could, just a little area like that in solar panels could power the entire planet. Obviously that would be quite inefficient because it's in the middle of the ocean so the power would run out by the time we got to land. But imagine, imagine chopping that up into millions of little pieces and scattering it all over the world so you still had the same area but it was scattered closer to source where you really need it would make a massive difference. I'm not saying it's going to be easy but when you think we have been given the sun yeah? and we've been given air and we've been given waves we've been given lots of things that can help us live a sustainable life. And I think it's only through technology that we'll be able to do it. And we're, we're just too slow. We are just frighteningly slow. We are so far behind the curve, you would never believe. There's some great work being done, but we all sound like lefty hippies when we talk about it. Yeah? Rather than actually being forward-thinking futurologists. Love that. I'm going to use that a lot now. And you think with a car, right? I mean, I'm just as bad. Don't get me wrong. I've had a diesel car for ages. Someone told me diesel was clean, and now they tell me that it's not. Yeah? And it is daft, isn't it? We take all these fossil fuels, gets transported all around the world, all these refineries, turn it into petrol. And every time I go and fill my car up, when it's empty, it costs me 100 quid. 100 quid. I am paying to wreck the planet and then pollute it after I've driven my car. Fucking stupid, isn't it? And we all do it because that's what the system provides for us. Yeah? Thankfully, a few disruptors have come along and said, we want to do it differently. There's something else I want to talk about that. Yeah. A few disruptors have come along and said, we want to do it differently. Yeah. Some have done it to survive, to be honest with you. But it actually took someone like Tesla to start disrupting the market. Yeah. And all right, they're, they're high value cars. They're really expensive. Of course they are. Um, the battery technology is good, it's not as brilliant as it should or could be, and that's because we haven't done enough R&D, but they've woken up to that. So when, they go, when the car industry goes to government now and the government says, well, what do you want? What, what do you need from us? They go, better batteries. We want better, lighter batteries that can be charged quicker, and can you help us with some infrastructure? It's a very clear ask, actually, and in fairness, they're getting on with it. That R&D and that investment is happening. But even before we can get into the ecological side, the car industry were innovating at a better level than the building industry were. And so when it comes to heating homes, it's been talked about a little bit, it's actually really straightforward, you know. It really isn't rocket science. How we do it isn't easy, but what we need to do is super easy. We just want loads of insulation. Triple glazing would be good. They were using triple glazing in Scandinavia as standard in 1975. 
while we were still going around trying to flog crap double glazing systems to people in the 1980s. You know, there's something about us. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the uh, suspicious minds slide. There's something about us. We're a bit weird. You know, during the Victorian age, we were the, we were the biggest innovators. We were driving industry, driving technology. The stuff that we, and I'm not romanticizing it, it was groundbreaking on a global scale. Now we're a bit like, oof, how do we legislate for that? Ooh, you know, health and safety, ooh, the banks, how they're gonna fund it. Fuck like that, let's just get on with it. Really simple, stuff. that's even before you talk about how you heat your house. You want a bit of ventilation, you want high insulation standards, and you want triple glazing. And that's why I think, the government should be changing legislation in a massive, radical way. Now, the first thing that comes back to me whenever I say that is, house prices will go up. If you do that, George, and we increase the eco-credentials of Britain's homes, the build quality, the design quality, if we push design and build to a high level, that's just going to increase house prices and we're all going to die. <laughs> You've been sold a myth. It's already been mentioned. What is massively overinflated at the minute is land because of that supply demand, because of planning and everything else as well. It's, it's everyone's fault. I'm not blaming anyone in particular. It's actually the system's fault. But, you know, we are the system, you know. We can always go, it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. We are the system. We vote in politicians. You know, we set standards. We do. It's up to us to change things. Land value is incredibly high. Now, if I say, let's do a price for 100 amazing ecological homes on this piece of land. Obviously, the build price is going to be expensive. Yeah. Do you pass that on to the consumer? No, because they're not going to buy it. Yeah. So you have to send it down to the land cost and the tender. So you should be paying less for the land to build a better product that people can then still afford. Now, the reason why that's not going to happen, unless the entire industry buys into it, is that someone's going to buy it off them for a higher price and build a lesser quality product to still make their profits. Yeah? So at the minute, it's a race to the bottom. Yeah? High value land, low crap build costs, profit, resale. What we should be doing is saying, no, no, let's start with design and a better quality product. And how do we adjust the economic factors to allow that product to be the best that we can possibly build? The only way you can do that is through everybody buying into the same standard. It's the only way it's going to work. Because if, if you spend £250 a square foot rather than £150 a square foot building a house, someone's going to put a bid in for more money for the land. And you're going to get out bid and they're going to build something shit. Yeah? So we have to raise the entire design standards to drive down land prices. It's controversial, I know, but how else do you do it? How else do you do it? But the scary comment at the minute is, if we improve building design standards and ecological standards, the purchase is going to have to pay for it and take on more debt. It's just not going to happen, is it? So when it comes to things like air source heat pumps, which we obviously have talked about a lot today, the first question that gets asked is, how can I afford that? How can I pay for it? And it's a valid question, isn't it? So you need someone to find the capital cost to buy that bit of kit, get it installed. Now, we all know that we're going to save money. You know, it might be 800 quid a year, 1,200 pounds a year, depending on the scale and size of your house. So over that six, seven, eight year initial period, you know that that piece of kit is going to be paid for. Obviously, if you're getting RHI and stuff as well, it's going to be paid off even faster than that. But in fairness, it's about finding that capital cost, isn't it? Now, your kind of self-builders will start doing it. Your self-builders will invest in that because we know that self-builders build a higher quality product. We know that self-builders will generally invest more in the quality of their house because they're building it themselves. Yeah? But for some of the kind of, if I'm honest, lay person who can't really afford it, how do they do it? So the system has to change for that provision to be made for them. And as far as I'm concerned, as radical as it might be, we should be changing the building regs to increase insulation standards so that every single new built house has an air source heat pump as standard and everyone has triple glazing. And you think, well, why not? Let's just do it. If you do it, the industry will change for it. I'm not going to talk about air source heat pumps anymore. You've heard loads about them. You know enough about them already. 
Well, we know how good they are, don't they? They keep banging on about it. <laughs> and they talk, it's interesting, because I didn't even know the guys were going to talk about the circular economy today. So I was going to present this as like a new idea, which is obviously not. <laughs> uh, but isn't it interesting, isn't it? Like, if we design homes that they can be made and made again. You know, and one of the things I'd be saying to Mitsubishi, actually, is it's great that you've come up with this bit of kit. It's fantastic as a piece of R&D. But how can that be recycled? You know, I think as a manufacturer, you need to take on a corporate responsibility for every component in that bit of kit to be recycled, and reused, or repurposed in some form, shape, or way, just as I want to think about the same way about how a house might be built. So creativity and innovation and home design can build, actually, a restorative economy because we actually need to start restoring the planet. And why can't we build houses, if we set ourselves the challenge, why can't we build houses that actually give back to Mother Nature rather than taking away? That every house that's built makes a positive contribution to the natural environment rather than destroying it. Surely that's what we should be doing, to be a truly sustainable planet, respectfully integrating our ways of living with Mother Nature, working with nature rather than against it, creating spaces that have a psychological well-being, that have positive health benefits on the way that we live in a home, that we feel good about, that we can afford, that we can run efficiently, that we can run ecologically, that might even have a cost benefit to us rather than a cost loss. And you know, I make um, amazing spaces. I, honestly, I filmed a guy yesterday, it's just yesterday, uh, and he's not some kind of hippie, he's a young, innovative lad, fantastic guy. And he went, George, I am not buying a house to be mortgaged for the next 25 years. And being tied to that debt and the worry and the stress. He bought a truck, he's trying to make it eco. He's built a little house on the back. And he said, I don't have to pay any rent, I don't have to pay any bills and I'm completely off grid. Might sound a bit hippie, but it's honestly, it's not because we've got a young generation coming through who think differently, who want to live differently. The RIBA, my institution, the Royal Institute of British Architects, came to me a few years ago and said, uh, will you help us, will you back a campaign um, against people building smaller houses, like smaller space planning, smaller rooms? I said, you do know that I make amazing spaces, don't you, which is all about <laughs> small space living. <laughs> I knew what they were getting at. They were talking about just substandard spaces in, in everyday homes, and I get that. And we're, we are one of the, you know, we're one of the daftest nations in the world, really, because we, we sell houses based on number of bedrooms rather than square footage. It's actually only in London where people talk about square footage a lot. You know, a lot of the time it's like, oh, is it a three bedroom or a four bedroom? You don't really get into how, how the you know, cost per square foot and how much it costs you to run per square foot. So small can actually be really beautiful. The nice thing about living small is it all costs less. Cheaper to build, cheaper to run, cheaper to heat, cheaper to light. All right, there's a point where something becomes too small, where it becomes uncomfortable. That's just daft. But this is what young people are looking at. I'm an old fart compared to a lot of people that I'm filming now in Amazing Spaces. There are people in their early 20s, mid 20s who are thinking radically and differently to the way I even thought when I was at university. And they want innovative, high quality, efficient, but most importantly, affordable spaces. And I'll tell you what, they want them to be green. Hand on heart, they want them to be green. And I think we've got a responsibility in the industry to provide that to the next generation. So we live in a time where people want to get more creative with space, how it works, pushing the boundaries of home design, and they want to be greener. So we need to design and build in a very different way. Why don't we just build homes the same way that we build cars? All right, there's a big issue of land. I get that. But you look at the R&D, that collectively, and this is why I keep talking about a cultural change, if the building industry all came together and collectively wanted that systematic change, they would do it. The car industry have done it. Apart from VW, they were a bit dodgy, weren't they? A little bit cheeky. Um, but it's amazing, isn't it? You don't build a car in a field, in the, in the outdoors, in the pouring rain. You don't plaster the inside of it and render the outside of it, do you? I'd just be daft. 
yeah, you build it in a controlled environment. High, the amount of R&D that goes into the manufacturing of a new car model is enormous. It's about half a billion quid of upfront research and development costs in a brand spanking new model car. What investment do we make on a new house type? Pfft, peanuts, hardly anything whatsoever. And honestly, let's just say you forget about architects, even though I am one, just forget about us. Let's say you went to one of these fellas, you know, Conran, Jonathan Ive at Apple or Dyson, or, or Ian Callum at Jaguar, and said to them, can you design a new built housing estate? You just know for a fact it wouldn't look like that, would it? <laughs> we know that. It just wouldn't look like that. And yet we allow it to continue to happen. So if we want to create better quality homes, for me, it's about innovation and education. That's systematic change. Working with nature rather than destroying it. Advanced forward thinking, driving green innovation. And technology having the opportunity to replicate nature. It's really important, this. You might think I'm being a bit weird and a bit off the wall. Technology replicating nature. Why? Because she's bloody good, you know. She is incredible. Mother Nature is quite an amazing thing when you think about it. How it replenishes itself, how it fixes itself. Think about us. I cut myself on a building site, I will fix myself in a few days. That's nuts. If you actually get your head around that, that's fucking crazy, isn't it? My skin will go to start rebuilding and fixing. That is amazing. And you might have seen it on the news recently, there's, a, there's this new kind of self-repairing concrete. I was like, oh my God, we shouldn't be self-repairing concrete. It's like one of the most carbon greedy materials out there. We should be thinking differently about that as well. But Mother Nature, well, think about it. You know, we've been given the sun, we've been given all of these amazing natural things out there. But Mother Nature is absolutely brilliant. And I get really, again, this is not a lefty, weird, hippie thing. Right? I get really inspired by it. I still can't work out how a chameleon works. I think it's the nuts. You know, how it can change its surface skin colour based on the environment that it's in. That is a direct response to the environment that it lives in. But what leaves do, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's fabulous, really. Now that's science, that's technology, that's innovation. And if we can push science and technology and innovation and design, and I mean design in the most holistic sense of the word, to replicate nature, we've got a chance of saving the planet and at the same time living better quality lives while we're on this planet. It's not just about being an eco-warrior, it's about us having a better, more sustainable, happier, healthier quality of life for the time that we're on the planet. And I'm one of the biggest critics of architecture. <laughs> I mean, this is designed by Frank Gehry. It's the Louis Vuitton building, HQ in Paris, right? And it's funky and it's cool and you walk around it and the spaces are awesome. And I mean, it's, it's a very, oh, I can't say what I really think, I'll get in trouble. Um, and you've got all these fancy skins, they do they don't do anything. It's like someone's just pushed the kind of funky shape making button on some CAD bit of software to make it look cool. It's a, fun, it's a fabulous looking building. Honestly, it's beautiful when you walk around it. But why couldn't those skins be like a piece of human skin or a leaf or that chameleon? Why couldn't it be a responsive system? Why couldn't it be something so amazingly intelligent that it was making that building be its own little kind of ecological microsystem? and somehow given back to the planet rather than taken away. What a lost opportunity that is. It makes me see the building in a completely different way when I think like that. It's such a shame. It cost a billion quid as well. It wasn't like they didn't have the money. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's stupid. And I think they got the land for free. <laughs> but this is why I talk about science. Nanotechnology. I didn't even know that, what that was until about 1998 when I got to university. You know, think about materials like Gore-Tex. Amazing developments in, in material fabric technology. Something that breathes, you know. And we're still only just scratching the surface of the potential of what materials can do. You know, Pilkington, self-cleaning glass. That's come about in the industry in the last few years. Heated glass now. But, you know, we've had heated glass since, like, the 1970s. I mean, my granddad's Datsun had had the little coil in the glass, and it was heated glass. 
Now it's like all fancy, so you don't say the coil anymore. But you know, that's taken 30 or 40 years to get to that level. Too so. But nanotechnology now in science is providing all sorts of opportunities for us to think differently, build differently, and design differently. I've got to finish up in a second, but I've put this in um, just because I love science and I'm all a bit science driven. Um, this looks like it's a roof light, doesn't it? With the sun outside, shining lovely light into an interior space. It's, not, it's an artificial light. Because there's this little scientist in Italy, and he studied one simple thing. Why is the sky blue? Do you know what the answer to that is? Anyone know? Yeah. So it's called the Raleigh scattering effect. So it's a certain wavelength of light comes from the sun and it hits the earth at a particular angle and has a certain wavelength to it. And as it vibrates and refracts off the atmosphere, it creates a colour which is blue because that is the wavelength that gets through the atmosphere rather than being deflected by it. Which is why, why does the sky look different when the sun sets? Because the sun's at a different angle to where you're positioned on the globe. So there's a different wavelength of light coming through the atmosphere, then it's more orange and it's more red in changes as the sun sets. So this guy went, that's actually really cool. Can I design a light fitting that can replicate Mother Nature? And through nanotechnology, he's changed the surface material of that actual skylight to replicate the same bluish colour that can come through the atmosphere from the sun. So this is actually in the basement of a building with no natural light whatsoever. And I filmed it, and I'll tell you now, I stood there and I was looking at it going, it's a skylight, that is really the sun. And they're going, no, it's not. You're three stories underground. It really isn't. Now, obviously, we'd all prefer real natural light than artificial light, but I love the fact that it's been a science-based, driven piece of home innovation that can change the way spaces feel. Funny enough, the quality of the light that actually shines through it is a big lamp, so it even gives off a little bit of warmth as well. And you can change the settings to be a Nordic light, Mediterranean light, or an English light. You wouldn't want an English light. That's too grey. <laughs> That's it, yeah, yeah. I flicked the switch and just did that. But isn't that amazing? I love that. I mean, it's, it's expensive, but it's... I don't mind things being expensive when you're innovating initially. Yeah, I remember my dad bought his first Peter Max video. I think it was about half the price of the house. <laughs> you know, I think he spent like 350 quid, which in like 1979 or something was a shitload of money. And now you can go and buy a DVD pair from Tesco for, you know, 15, 20 quid. I'm not sure about its eco credentials and where it was made, but let's not get into that. But it's amazing that, that that innovation can change things. So, just very quick, last two minutes. Uh, someone said to me uh, a number of years ago, rather than talking about it and banging on about it, why don't you do something about it? And um, yes, I lobby governments. Yes, I work with big business, and I'm always trying to change their way of thinking as much as I possibly can. But actually, the easiest way to change it is through educating young people. It's the, it's the bottom-up approach. That's what I get really excited about. It's people a lot younger than me asking the same questions or similar questions that I was asking when I was a kid and doing things differently. So I set up MOBI, which is the Ministry of Building, Innovation and Education. It's all about innovative home designs. If you go to moby.org.uk, um, it's an educational charity. Uh, we're working with a number of schools and universities at the minute. Um, I'm not going to say we're trialling the courses because they're all up and running and they're doing really, really well, but we're doing it on a on a kind of micro scale at the minute and getting it absolutely 100% right before we roll it out nationwide. But we are going to create some regional Moby facilities because obviously different regions have different needs in terms of their homes and housing design. We might even get some vernacular architecture back to blend with their uh, local regions rather than all looking the same. Um, and it's all about new ways of making for new ways of living in Britain's homes. And it's about research and development pushing the boundaries of creative thinking. We've got further education courses, higher education courses. Um, I shouldn't really be telling you this, but I might as well. Next year, we're going to be launching our schools courses 
because our wonderful um, education minister decided to take uh, design and technology out of the national curriculum, which is probably the stupidest thing that the government's ever done, along with many other stupid things they've done. Um, because if you think about it, all the conversation that I've just had with you is about design. Actually, when you think about it, all right, we've talked about cost and everything else, but it's all design-led, isn't it? The chair you're sitting on now has been designed and made. The carpet you're walking on has been designed and made. The building we're in has been designed. The clothes you're wearing have been designed and made. It's all designed and made, all of it. And unless we put design, and I keep saying that holistic word, it's not just about what something looks like, which is what most people think design is, it's about everything to do with the product. If we design and think differently, we've got a chance of transforming Britain into a much stronger knowledge economy. We are not going to have the industrial revolution that we had from back in the day. Because China have got more people, Brazil's got more people, Russia's got more people. We're not going to become this like superpower manufacturing industry because we can't compete with the numbers of people who will make and build. And we probably can't compete with the low wages if I'm really honest, but what we can be is a brilliant knowledge economy, an amazing knowledge economy, who innovate, who disrupt, who think differently, and then work with lots of organisations and countries around the world to think differently too. And I'm hoping that these courses will be the first step to do it. And we're doing off-site manufacturing. Um, I've invested in a business where we're doing off-site manufacturing. But, and do you know what, we're, without being arrogant about it, we're one of the best. Right? But we're still probably only scratching about 2 to 3% of the potential of off site manufacturing. If I took someone from Jaguar from their factory to our factory, they'd go, That's not a factory. It's a big shed where you're building timber frame houses. Because we're not automated enough. Why? Because I'm struggling to recruit. Because I'm trying to not take people from the conventional building industry to come and work in our factory. Because all I'll get is, Well, we don't do it like that, mate. Yeah. So I'm trying to recruit people from factories and from supply chains and from an innovative manufacturing industry rather than from the conventional building game. But the potential, just like the potential for heat pumps, is massive. It is enormous. With the right people, the right way of thinking and innovating in design, we can do things very, very differently. And for me, when, when our schools programme comes out next September, that will be when I know Moby has really landed. We've had a number of design challenges. We set these Moby design challenges with schools and colleges and universities, and we put everybody in at the same level. Now, this is no disrespect to some of the great further education, higher education students out there, but I don't think it's any coincidence that every group that's won our Moby design challenges have been under the age of 14. I'm serious. I could tell you now, I could put the schemes up and ask you to pick the best scheme anonymously. And if you pick the same one that I picked, you would be picking the ones where it was under 14. And it's not just some willful shape making, you know. It's really interesting questioning about how a house should be built and how it should be made. And that's what I get really excited about. In some ways, again, no disrespect, but the system is set up in a way where we're kind of programming our kids in a certain way to think in a certain way. So they're designing in a certain way and they're building in a certain way. And it's not necessarily the best way to do it. They're already being slightly contaminated by a conservative system. So hopefully Moby might make a bit of a difference. Because all I'm after, this is the existing national house building process. Slow, fairly uninspiring, no R&D. Linear economy. What we're after is a circular economy, feeding back in, learning, loads of feedback. You're designing, building, making, creating great communities, learning from that, doing it differently if we've got it wrong. Not just repeating the same mistakes that we do all the time. So that we're not slow, but we're high speed. So we've got a massive amount of R&D and we're really inspiring to create new places to live. Thank you very much. <laughs>